You are listening to Backstage Pass Podcast, hosted by Hannah Trigwell and brought to you by Yolanda. Shell Zenner, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Hannah Trigwell? Good. I'm good. The sun is shining. I'm not in a room that has windows, but um, you, you are. I am in a, a room that has a window, although for uh, audio purposes, I've closed it. Gotta say, slightly warm. Slightly warm in here today. Right? Yeah. 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 We should be out in the sun, really. I know. Things to discuss. Yeah, things to talk about, people to see, you know, <laughs> internet chats to have. So for those of uh, the listeners and the watchers who don't know you already, tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, I am a music journalist and a radio presenter, producer, blogger, uh, all sorts of different stuff. I have my finger in a lot of different pies. Uh, I work for BBC Introducing in West Yorkshire and Manchester. I also present on XS Manchester and Amazing Radio, uh, where I've been on air for eight years. So basically, I like to hang around in venues, struggling with that right now, um, skulking around and discovering (laughs) and unearthing unheard of brand new talent. And shouting about it everywhere, basically. And what draws you to new talent? I don't know. I guess, right, I thought about this the other day. My parents aren't really music fans. I mean, my mum gets in the really? car and she, No, no, not at all. Um, they, they don't really go to gigs. They don't really have any records. In fact, my mum gets in the car and she turns the radio off. So I'm not actually sure where I come from uh, for in, in relation <laughs> to that. But I guess because I'm kind of all self-taught, like from yeah. when I was growing up, the music I got into when I was a teenager and as a youth uh, through to now. And I guess I've never really had that education from my family in terms of music Mm. so I guess for me I always I just kind of because I self-taught I just thought it was easier to stick with new because you could it didn't really matter necessarily what had been before but also I'm obsessed to everything new I mean I'll walk through a supermarket and if there is a new brand of biscuits or a new variety of that part like that bar of chocolate or sauce or whatever I'm on it I, w- I want to wow. try it. I think I'm just drawn inherently to new, shiny things. Maybe I'm a magpie. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Maybe you were a magpie in a former life. How does that, does that make you feel differently about established or older bands, artists or products in general? I mean, it depends. What do you mean by old? I mean, like, a st- like mm, legacy. I play a lot of older music on XS Manchester and that doesn't, you know, it never gets tired, like the classics right. that make you feel good. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, music is, lo- it's it's like life changing anyway, isn't it? Like a song mm. can transport you to a place, a time in your life. It can, you know, it can really just change your day from a rubbish day to a good day or even a great day. So I think that's, that's the power of music anyway. But obviously I love music of all forms, but but my little niche that I love is like sticking a pair of headphones on and listening to hundreds of new tunes and just finding something that completely blows my ears off and makes me want to instantly find everything out about that artist is like the best feeling it really is. Do you get the familiarity of the song structure when a chorus comes at the right time and I'm just trying to figure out because because my in my head like I feel like I'm naturally the opposite way around from you I really like familiar and like stuff new stuff sometimes freaks me out if I don't understand it properly most people will go for the familiar. There is a reason yeah. that, you know, the music that's on the Radio 2 playlist is the voices that you're used to, the Adele's, the Lewis Capaldi's, even at the new end of the spectrum. They're very much recognisable voices. I mean, Snow Patrol is the most played song on radio, Run, mm. which everybody knows that song, don't they? Everybody knows it. But, yeah, I just think, I don't know, I think I... um trained in a different way um I've always liked discovering a new artist before they've blown up I've been the one playing Arctic Monkeys out of my broken Samsung phone to my friends going (laughs) you have to hear this band they're amazing uh, before they've blown up I just I love shouting about it so I don't know I I like the familiarity and comfort of you know certain albums I can think back and think Radiohead the Benz saved my life when I was 18 you know it really did Mm. but yeah, I just think for me, 
it's all in discovering you know a new tune or a new artist it doesn't have to be a new artist it could be just a new tune by an artist that I know and yeah you can just hear the quality in the music whether it's the recording it doesn't even have to be um like exceptionally produced sometimes you can just hear the magic in the songwriting um Mm. It is a really special thing, but also really hard to describe yeah. when you listen to so many hundreds of tracks. What makes that track stand out? And we all have our own biases of the types of genres that we, you know, have an affinity for. But I like to think that I can hear the beauty in all genres. Um uh, and I really do like to champion as many a uh, broader horizon of artists because especially at the moment, I feel like artists really need that help. So mm. it's just a magical chemistry, chemistry, isn't it? The chemical reaction in your brain that just makes you smile when you hear something that you just think, yes, that is a great tune. I can't wait to watch that artist's journey to watch where they get to, uh, where yeah. they progress to with that particular sound. What would you say is the right way to approach radio oh it's a difficult one because um it really depends how much history you've got whether you've been in bands before how much you know how many contacts you've got if you're a new artist that literally knows nothing you've started tinkering around and playing music in the last couple of years then I think there's so much that you can do just by doing your homework and listening Um, you can listen to radio you can listen to podcasts you can engage with people on social media that are passionate about music and you can really do your homework and what I would say is look at what are uh, the artists that you aspire to be like the ones that you think you have a resonance with see where they're getting some love on either like journalistic perspective or radio and try and reach out to those particular people now there's loads of platforms out there whether it's from community radio hospital radio student radio that you can get your music to people in in their emails really quickly or for us like bbc introducing and amazing tunes for both bbc introducing and amazing radio are really easy platforms to get your music on but then you know there's other radio platforms you just sometimes if you're not sure just do a bit of googling if you can't find the answer there just check out one of the djs that you think would play your music based on the playlist that they've been putting out there get in touch with them ask them how they prefer to to receive their music i mean i did actually write a eight point article for getting radio play in lockdown for the musicians union which is up on their website now so and basically it says all of this and more all the things that you can do uh, to help yourself at this time and nice. yeah I think sometimes just doing a bit of homework around it and seeing where you would fit in um, mm. can actually go a long way um, reaching out to the right people is the most important thing uh, to not waste your time and always personalize your contact whatever you're doing don't add loads of attachments that are going to fill people's inboxes but always really personalize it and say oh listen to your show the other day and you played this person and if you like them I think you'll really like what I'm doing well that's going to get a far better reaction to someone like me who gets thousands of emails I'm going to go all right they sound interesting I might definitely check them out and then you know obviously make sure I've got a link if it's a for amazing radio airplay if you send me an amazing tunes link it's going to be brilliant because if I like it I'll go then add to my play playlist and uh, you might end up on the playlist next week it can happen really quickly amazing we can literally listen to it that morning and get it on on air that afternoon oh that wow evening. it is nice. it can be pretty quick there's been a few artists tripped up on that recently they're like actually i've arranged a premiere somewhere and i'm like well you know what can we do it's it's kind of done um mm. but yeah you need to be really specific about you know if you're putting a little campaign plan together which is always a really good idea if you are planning you know radio play uh, people writing about your music on websites like the line of best fit it does help if you have a, a little plan of action around around your release um, as well, I think. Do you say that email is the best way then to get in touch with presenters or producers? No, I would probably say it's the worst way these days because Ah. actually, you know, I've got about 40,000 on red emails and it's not from wanting to get to them, but actually, you know, even like an interview request or something just gets lost in my email because there's that many. I would honestly say for me, I, where I get to 
curate radio, I would say go to the uploaders, put your biogs on those uploads, put all the information there. because It's really easy to find it. It's really easy for us to go back and, d- and dig it out and to share that that information with multiple people. It, the easiest way is on the uploader and any kind of history and plays will get listed on that as well. So I think social media is a difficult one as well. It's fine to like reach out to somebody and engage with them or maybe ask them where they prefer to receive their music but just bear in mind if you are messaging somebody who has thousands of followers and who gets a lot of responses it's really easy for those messages to disappear so it's almost Mm. like I would say uploader kind of with all your biog information and information about your release on the biog followed by email but you know don't necessarily expect a response back if you email and it's not because people are rude but it's just because they are frankly overwhelmed and it's yeah just got to that stage already where it is just very difficult and very overwhelming mm. to actually you know get through everything so it's if you send the information just be happy that you've sent that information hopefully if the person plays it they've got the information to hand because you've sent it over but yeah make it your subject quite idiot proof or something in your email like if it's uh, yeah. your n- artist name or something like that or the name of your release or something that could easily be like searched in an email inbox I think there's a, a few smart moves that you could do like that that would maybe help but yeah in <laughs> Instagram Instagram and Twitter things just disappear off the face of the planet really quickly. yeah I I I find it really hard to keep on top of Instagram messages particularly. I don't know about you. Things just get lost in there and then get pushed way down and it's just impossible. If you tag anyone in a post, which you might have to for work, then automatically if you've tagged five people, then the, 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 the last person that messaged you is like five messages down already and almost off the screen. So just be mindful of those kind of things when you're contacting people on socials, I think, because it's yeah. um, quite a useful thing to remember if you want to maximise your chance of being remembered. And also just don't hassle people. Like I had somebody the other day who's, and I know they're really keen, but not everything is under my control, for instance you know it is you know when like for BBC introducing everything works as a team so that one person can't you know call the shots necessarily so you have to bear in mind that if you message someone five times that's great and they will have heard your message but there might not be anything they can do about it so Mm. it's um yeah it's nice to be nice you must be getting loads more emails now that we're in lockdown I imagine (laughs) is that how it's it's going I think it's just it's continued at a solid pace. I would have said before lockdown, I didn't really get any emails on Sundays. Now I get emails on Sundays as well. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, I know. So that is seven days a week. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not complaining. You know, I'm here for people to shout to about their music, but it does make it quite challenging when you've got a lot of my time is spent with headphones on and, you know, or editing videos because I obviously do all the video editing and photo editing and all for my YouTube channel and, you know, podcast and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff to make when you do it 24, so like, you know, 360 yeah. degrees. Um, so actually getting to emails, unfortunately, is like the last in the pile and the ones that you've got to reply to are the, the people that are giving you work or, you know, you really urgently need to get back to. So a lot of it is PR and it's even if you have a specific work email I now get I get email uh, PR emails on my excess Manchester email on my BBC email so it gets a bit overwhelming when you've got like five email addresses and they're all getting PR it's like yeah very difficult so yeah and do you ever just think actually no I'm gonna switch off um, or do they I, all just come to you always? I always get them uh, on my phone as well. I do think it, it is really hard to, to to switch off. And I have to say it's increasingly difficult with lockdown because, you know, yeah. it's difficult to get out. And even though I'm going to two offices to work at the moment, I'm doing a lot of shows from home. Um, a lot of recording at home but yeah it's increasingly I don't remember the last time I actually sat down and watched a film and decided I was going to have a film night or something because <laughs> that's all you can really do is it similar for you I don't know yeah yeah I mean I, I, I thought I'd have watched a lot more films than I have done 
yeah, everyone seems to be watching a lot of films and I'm quite jealous of that in a way. But um, yeah. yeah, it's just one of those things, I guess. For the recording that you're doing at home, yeah. what kind of setup have you got right now? I Well, I've had a home studio uh, for a long time because um, I do voiceovers and stuff as well. I, right. I like to see myself as a portfolio worker. So I do lecturing and artist development. Um, I do voiceovers. I do radio production uh, and radio presenting. I obviously do curation. I've done live gigs. I interview people on stage at festivals. I DJ. I co-curate my own nights, usually at Band on the Wall that have not happened for the last few months, obviously. So I like, uh, I've had my own home set up, uh, which has come into its own very much so over the last few months. But um, yeah. usually uh, it's what you can kind of see in front of me. It's my, I've got a vocal booth. If it is a voiceover though, sometimes it is as rudimentary as putting the quilt behind me over my head because uh, it depends on the quality that they want from the voiceover. That's actually a great tip though, isn't it? Why? What? I mean, you see, we've all seen people literally putting their head into a curtain or putting their head into a pile of cushions under a desk. It is possible to record voiceovers uh, that way and, you know, vocals. I'm sure you would say the same. So, I mean, I've got <laughs> headphones. I've got a Rode NT-USB. I've also got an Audio-Technica 2020 here which is just at the side of me. Uh, I've got an iMac uh, with Adobe Audition, which is what I use as standard for recording any audio. Uh, I've also got uh, a load of equipment that I have, like a DSLR camera with a Rode mic. I've got um, a Zoom uh, H6 and XLR mics. Oh, cool. So I've got XLR mics for that as well, um, Rode ones as well. Uh, I've got another Roland voice recorder, which I use for interviews out and about. I've got an iRig that works with an iPad, um, all sorts of mic stands. And yeah, you just end up with a load of different stuff. I've also got an iMac that mm. basically go uh, not an iMac, a MacBook that goes everywhere with me as well. So, you know, a yeah. lot of tech, tech equipment almost for every eventuality. But, <laughs> you know, it's kind kind of come in over the last few months to be honest because you know I've needed to use a lot of it and I have a load of headphones as well um I generally use uh Bose um kind of bluetooth wire wireless ones which are noise cancelling and just amazing and the ones I've got in right now are noise cancelling as well which make a big difference um nice always very worried about my ears you know like making sure I'm protecting them fully because obviously when you spend so much time listening to music you're very unaware of the damage that you could be doing to your hearing so yeah definitely so how are you feeling about not going to all the gigs and stuff yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's your ears are getting a rest for sure I don't know whether they are though <laughs> oh, do you really? know what it's it's really funny that I've been through spells in my life where I've had so much work that I've not been able to get to enough gigs. I don't know yeah. about you, but it makes me feel really disconnected. It's those conversations you have around the gig with other people in the bands or other mm -hmm. artists that are there or, you know, just people that go and see live music. It makes me feel very disconnected, although at the moment, it, I suppose we're all feeling like that. So, yeah. There's a little bit of comfort in the fact that, well, you're not missing anything because actually it's not really happening, but it's happening online. Yeah. And then the reality is, what are you missing? Because you can't be watching everything simultaneously. I know you because you are a radio producer and presenter, but I've not seen a lot of you as a music journalist. So what does that involve? What do you do with Ooh. music journalism? I have done lots of stuff across the board in terms of reviewing gigs. I have done uh, single reviews in magazines. I used to write for Fly magazine in years gone by. Used to oh, write cool. for Louder Than War. I've written for um, the likes of the 405. So I guess it, it does come part and parcel with what I do because I work for Introducing and Amazing. Because I champion new music, I guess part of my job I see is music journalism. But yeah, yeah. I also go and talk to people about portfolio working, which is, and being a music journalist, which is how I got into being so heavily passionate about music and, you know, champion it from multiple platforms. I used to have my own blog. Um, and I do write occasionally for people. Like I said, I wrote for the Musicians Union recently. So I do like to yeah. think, you know, my knowledge is mainly around specialist music from a radio perspective, I guess. 
you could be doing talk radio, you could be talking about sport, you could be, you know, uh, basically working on an entertainment show that isn't focused on specialist music. So I think if you work in specialist mm. music radio, it's pretty normal to be a music journalist and a radio person. But yeah. it's more about the music, I guess, as as the way into the radio um, for me. How do you even start doing something like that I mean do do you just email them and just say I go to a load of gigs I love music I've written this thing I think the first couple yeah that I went you know the websites that I would read and I would say well I really quite like to talk about this band could I go to the gig on your behalf and you know maybe write you a review and they'd be like yeah cool we'll sort you some guest list or something I was like brilliant Wow, (laughs) this is life changing. Whereas, um, you know, by some of the later opportunities, the Fly magazine, I had a uh, another person had stepped down. So, you know, the opportunity came available and I became aware of it. Um, But, you know, with other things, it was more like word of mouth of the people reading my reviews or knowing me as a face out and about in town at gigs and knowing my knowledge and specialism that they asked me to do stuff. So... Yeah, they weren't all monetized opportunities, you know. Sometimes yeah. I did a lot of work for free and I did community radio for about four or five years. I did for free, just honing my skills, learning myself, teaching myself how to sound edit and how to interview people. My first dictaphone was 43 quid off eBay. Um, nice. Yeah, I bought some cheap software and learned how to teach myself to sound edit. You know, I'm literally all self-taught. First person I interviewed was the drummer from The Temper Trap. Toby. Wow. Toby was lovely and very patient. Oh, I love that band. Sweet Disposition was riding really high at that time so as well. So good. So, so good. Such a nice band. Yeah. It's mad Watching. when you look back on it and, and think how you've got to where you have. But I guess for me, it's always been, I've never feel like I've really been given like things on a plate. I've always worked really hard for it and built a lot of networking and a a lot of relationships and also by being a good person that's resourceful and can you know I can I can do the copy for a voiceover I can get the tone and I can record it and I can edit it you know because I can do 360 with a lot of stuff it does allow people to think oh yeah she's a good person to work with because she can pick things up and she can tailor stuff to whatever we want and I think that flexibility helps in quite a um, intensely commercial world I see that you're very good at networking and I am someone who would very freely admit that I'm terrible at networking what advice would you give me <laughs> for that um, I, d- I don't think you're terrible at networking you're just I think I'm pretty but I, I just you know like when we when we're in like music industry situations I feel there's a pressure, right, mm. to explain yourself. Why are you there? What can you have to offer other people? And that makes me shrivel a little bit and keep to myself a little bit. And so it's not good for networking. So, and I am very aware of that. Um, but I think I talk myself out of it as well I think that's a common feeling though in the music industry I think it's like an imposter syndrome like why am I here and you're not alone I get that too actually is somebody that appears a very good networker has a lot of contacts I can be very overwhelmed in social situations that I don't really I wouldn't really shout myself out and about you know I'll talk Mm. to the people I know I think that's a pretty normal feeling because Often we're self-deprecating and we don't bang our own drum enough about how much we know and how good we are. And, you know, I I think it's a really important thing to think that if you're not going to talk yourself up, who who else is going to do it? Because, you know what, people won't. It's a dog-eat-dog industry, as I'm realising, every day. (laughs) And um, I think... I, I would say for communicating with new people, the, the, the basic thing that I would say to any musician or anybody wanting to work in the media industry is just number one, don't be a dick. You yeah. know, don't make it all about you. You know, ask to learn, ask to shadow, um, you know, ask to help. 
you know, if you are that positive person that can really help somebody out in their hour of need, they're always going to think of you and come back to you. But if you're that person that just wants to make it all about them, you know, and it works top to bottom, I think, then, you know, people aren't going to want to work with you. Um, they want to work with positive people with ideas and technical equipment yeah. and that are resourceful that, you know, but also like team players as well because there's a lot of people that aren't team players um and i think mm. it makes a big difference just speak to p people with a civil tongue don't make out that you know more than somebody else because you just simply don't know what somebody's history is as well you don't know what their their background is um but yeah you know just be humble be humble be kind so are you looking forward to going back to gigs I imagine. I am, I am. <laughs> very much looking forward to getting back to gigs and festivals, although the reality is I don't think it's necessarily going to happen this year. No, I would imagine that it won't. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the reality is um, even if you do launch and relaunch your tour and set it all up that you know are people going to come and uh, I've I've read mm. a couple of articles of late I don't know if you've seen the same ones where people are saying the artists need to take shared responsibility and uh, I think that's very scary for a lot of artists I don't know how you feel about that yeah it is <laughs> yeah it's a tricky one really I mean I've seen a lot of artists postponing the releases of their music but a lot of artists are doing the, the complete other end of the spectrum and just putting out loads and loads of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because, you know, you would have thought that a lot more people are online, so it's a good time to consume things. But then some people that I've talked to are like, there's just so much. It's like, is it is the release going to get lost? I think it's that, like, there is a captive audience at the moment ready to listen because people can't go out, they can't go and do necessarily the things that they would normally be doing, so why not? Mm. But then on the other hand, if you're the type of artist that wants to back everything with a tour, make a big, like, you know, marketing campaign out of it, you're not really able to do that right now. You can't go and do in-stores, you know, there's limited opportunities available other than doing visual, like, videos, uh, I know a lot of artists making videos right now um, because that's something you can help to push your campaign forward. But but yeah, it's, yeah. there's no right or wrong answer, but it, it, it I guess it depends on what's important, what's most important to you as an artist and how that fits in your plan, I guess. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, like I say. But In terms of some band or artists that you've seen that has all of their ducks in a row that you think is like smashing it. Ooh. Could you give any examples for the for the viewers or the listeners? Oh wow. Um I just said porridge a minute ago and like yeah. honestly I think that they are incredible and they're effortless. I need to look porridge up. P -O I need to look P O R I J. What genre is porridge? Oh my god, it's like a bit rave, a bit um, disco, yeah. a bit indie. P O R I J. They've only had three songs out. Ah, oh, okay. You can see what I mean, though. Their, their identity is quite strong. Yeah, that's cool. That looks really cool, actually. I'll have to have a listen to that. I think you'll like it. So, what if you're being completely honest? What's your favourite genre of music? Oh, I say, if you cut me in half, I would bleed post punk. Like. Yeah, I know that's not what you would expect, maybe, when you look no. at me. But actually, <laughs> I like harder, kind of, yeah. Um, the dives of this world, the shames of this world, um, yeah. Fontaine's, the murder capital, anything like that is just music to my ears, which is mental, really, because I love so much. Um, and, you know, it's... I was dancing in my garden yesterday to prosper you know I thought that guitar anthem is an absolute tune so you know because I listen to so much music it can be of any variety but I do have a real resonance with the intensity maybe it's like because I live in Manchester and Joy Division are from not far from here it's that kind of brooding darkness uh, it mm. rains a lot here it looks quite bright today but normally it's quite, can be overcast and a bit dark Maybe that yeah. that's all part of it. I don't know, but I, I do love post-punk. Um, yeah. Anything you hate? Ooh. 
Mm. Oh wait, my hate's a strong word. Hate is isn't a it? very anything strong you... <laughs> word because I have to anything you dislike. I have to really like hear the value in every kind of music, but I have to say yeah. I do find metal quite challenging. Right. Not yeah. really my strong point. Everything else, world music of every description. I love Afrobeat, I love indie electronic music, grime, rap, R and B, soul, hip hop. Um, you know, there's so many folk, country, um, you name it. I, I I care about it, but I do, yeah, metal's a little bit challenging, especially with some of the, you know, some of the very raw vocals uh, can be quite, whoa, blow your ears off. <laughs> <laughs> and do you ever get people from, you know, bands and artists that are definitely not the genre of the let's say the blogs or the site that you're writing for contacting you and saying can you can you do a review of this mm. i always feel like that's really dangerous isn't it i think because i'm more radio now i don't necessarily get that uh, i get more okay. like you know do you fancy playing this and of course or you know uploading it and that's fine because obviously even if i think that isn't my taste I can hear the value in the songwriting, in the musicianship. Yeah. And, you know, like for BBC Introducing, for instance, we can forward tracks over to Daniel P. Carter's show on Radio 1, uh, the rock show. So there are avenues that you yeah. can send things that you don't think are necessarily... Like on BBC Local, there's a lot of language that we can't necessarily play, where, which you can then forward on to the likes of One Extra that One Extra might be able to play. So it's yeah. just almost you know you know what makes a good song and you know a good song when you hear it um and you know just making sure it gets the right opportunities by forwarding it to the right channels so that's good that you're even able to do that because yeah. i feel like sometimes you know there must be a lot of artists and bands that send these emails out and even if the person thinks it's good but it's not something that would work for their radio show or their their blog it must just be parked where it is I imagine well I have previously emailed people and said you know it's not really for me it's hard to say that to any yeah. artist though but but and I would usually word it in a I think this might be liked by this person you know who, yeah. somebody who I know and recommend probably would appreciate that more than I necessarily I might do so I think sometimes it's just about piecing the jigsaw together for people isn't it so mm. I try and help wherever I can but obviously the inbox is a little bit overwhelmed sometimes yeah it sounds like it 40,000 yeah Ooh. I did say I was going to sort that before the end of lockdown but I'm not sure that's going to happen <laughs> do you get to a number and you uh, like think oh 40,000 okay cool that, that's fine there's no one read uh, technically there's no one read if it's the 40,000 but if it's 40,007 do you ever think about it like that? Because no. I, I have done that before and it, oh, it gets out of hand. It, out of hand. It's already out of hand and I just, ex I think it's the acceptance that it's out of hand. And it's <laughs> yeah. really funny because there's a Radio 1 presenter uh, called Jaguar who do, does a new music, she does a, a new music electronic show every week. It's incredible. If you haven't checked it out, go and, go and check it out. It's on Radio 1, um, the early hours of... Um, of uh is it monday morning yeah about half 12 um and yeah she's incredible but she said the other day like honestly i listen to the uploader every day just don't bother emailing me because i just can't get to it and i was like yes jaggy is feeling my pain um she is <laughs> hearing what i'm saying and she gets it because it's just mm. it's just too overwhelming it's a bit like that in um whatsapp group chats as well you know for team chats it's just like too many messages like so yeah, many messages, definitely. all a bit overwhelming. Maybe the energy is just better spent trying to create enough content that draws in an audience of your own. Because a lot of people see radio as a quick fix sometimes, especially if you suddenly get a song that really works on radio and a lot of people are taking it and playing it. And so it's almost like every time you go to a radio plug or every time you message a radio presenter, it's, it's like a roll of a dice, like the lottery. And if you get it and it's good and it works, then amazing. And it could happen and it does happen for people. And someone plays it on the radio and then somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and it goes crazy. Um, but that's not what happens for the majority of people, is it? No, we'll just put it in context, Hannah. If you had a choice between, I don't know, 100,000 watches of one of your songs on YouTube or a play on Radio 1, 
What would you choose? <laughs> ah. Oh. The, the the watches on YouTube. Is that because you're kind of biased because you know more about that in terms of what platform that can give you? Probably, yeah. <sighs> or maybe I was too that's generous a, with 100,000. That's a really hard one because if it was... If it's a one-off play on Radio 1, that would be awesome. But I I feel like it would be more awesome for my ego than it would be for my business. Whereas 100,000 unique plays of a video on YouTube, you know, they're, they're going off to suggested videos. They might be looking at other music. And I, I, I that's a really hard, that's a really hard... And you never know what might come off a Radio One play as well. I've had I've had opportunities from Radio One players, and that, and it's ah, oh, that's a hard question, you know, yes, isn't it? I think a lot of people yeah. have said to me, maybe I've not phrased it in such a way with a hundred thousand watches, but a lot of people that haven't had a Radio One play would still say, uh, I think a Radio One play because it means so much to the story it does mean to a be lot. able to add that to your biog. It's an incredible validation as well, and uh, and. As a tortured, mentally tortured artist, you crave validation sometimes for your art and to know that other people like it. And to have a play on Radio 1 is like the the pinnacle, really, in terms of radio. But I, if nothing were to come from... It's so hard to say. If it's a one-off play, it's so difficult. That's a really tough question. I'm so torn. Sorry. <laughs> what do you think would be better? Uh, a one-off play on Radio 1 or 100,000 streams on YouTube? I mean, again, I'm biased, so I'd probably say radio, but, you know, I it depends what the, the streams and the plays on YouTube would lead to and what stage you are, I suppose, with your your channel on YouTube. It's a, it's a crystal ball situation, isn't it? Yeah. For both outcomes, I suppose. Depends what you want, like what you want out of it, whether yeah. you want a better, like I suppose the Radio 1 play will make a difference to your biog more than, yeah. you know, the YouTube, but the YouTube might actually get you more followers across your social media, uh, more brand awareness. I, I don't, you know. Mm, it's tricky. Hard to know, Ooh. hard to know. Tricky question. I have a couple of last questions before we say goodbye. Okay. And the first one is, what is your track of the week? Oh, blimey. I haven't even done my listening yet. Do you know what? I'm going to say what I danced to while I was painting my fence yesterday. It's not brand new, but it's only a few months old. Prosper uh, guitar anthem. It's like... It's just the best electronic tune with elements of rave, 90s rave in there. It's just everything you need in a tune. And I could just honestly listen to that song for days it's so so good all the energy and it's like nice. the vibe i need right now because you need that like you were saying about not listening to sad songs it's that kind of energizing um electronic music it's not too heavy on the vocals or anything like that it's just all about the kind of building the instrumentation it's just great it's a proper tune if it doesn't make you dance around yeah. your garden while you're painting your fence ask for your money back what a good review <laughs> okay and then my last question is what is your best lesson the best lesson that you've learned so far in your career don't give up keep going keep learning you never know what's around the corner in all walks of life. Yeah. In, a, in any yeah. situation. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily where I want to be in life. You know, you, you very rarely sit back and think, where do I want to get to and how am I going to get there? But I think sometimes it's worth asking yourself that. But sometimes looking at what you're doing and thinking, I'm still learning. I'm still developing. I'm still the per I'm, yeah. I'm still becoming that person. Um, mm. And, you know, just keep going. Because if you're not in it, you're never going to win it. What a phrase. I know, I know. Thanks so much for speaking to me. It's been awesome uh, to have you on this podcast. My pleasure, Hannah. Lovely to chat to you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass.